Thank you very much for joining us here for a very special conversation on gender parity and the need for gender parity to try and foster the cause of economic recovery. My name is Shireen Bhan and it gives me great privilege and pleasure to welcome up here on this panel a very special set of guests who are going to be talking to us about this very important conversation that we hope to mainstream. I am also going to make this interactive so it would be nice if you do have questions and comments. Uh, I will get to you towards the end of our panel discussion discussion and we will engage with all of you as participants as well. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to our panelists here today. Uh, let me start from my left, Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning at Nigeria, Zainab Shamsuna. Emma, thank you very much for joining us. Smriti Irani, the Minister of Women and Child Development representing India. Ms. Irani, thank you very much for joining us. Ilian Goldfein, the President, Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C., the lone man on the panel. Thank you very much for joining us here as well. And Gabriela Buka, the Executive Director at Oxfam International, Kenya. Thank you very much, Gabriela, for joining us. I also want to make a note of uh, the fact that CNBC TV 18, uh, of course, we are India's leading news brand. We have started a campaign called the Future Female Forward initiative. It is a women's collective. We launched this in November and we hope to mainstream this conversation, not just in India, but take it global. And that is why we're here having this conversation. Now, I want to understand from you specifically, when we talk about social protection, when we talk about fiscal choices and fiscal space, and it is getting constrained, as Gabriella pointed out, the debt burden increasing at this point in time, we're in an era of higher interest rates and high inflation as well. How do you, as a leader, as a policy maker, make those choices? What are those choices going to be as you move forward? Well, um, it's indeed very difficult times. The world has been going through a number of crises, whether it's COVID or climate, several things that we have to cope with on a daily, on a daily basis. It means we have to do uh, more. We have to find how to do more with less because the fiscal space is indeed very, very constrained. A lot of our resources is going towards debt service. So for every Naira we spend, we try to see how do we get the most benefit from it. And, and that's one of the reasons why we have to take the decision to say, how does it affect women? Because not only because they're half of the population, but because they are further behind than the rest of the population. And also because they tend to, when you, when you give a small business, a woman small business money, they tend to manage it better and therefore more results, more outcomes. And we need to do this on a consistent basis and we need to do this according to our plan. So we did a national, medium term national development plan that across all of the sectors in the plan, we had the gender lens. And we costed the plan to require 775 uh, billion US dollars 15% of that plan is uh, contribution is from the government. So we need to now also find how we can support private businesses, both large, small, as uh, medium, as well as small enterprises to contribute more to the economy. We need to also look at how do we create partnerships between the public and the private sector to enable the private sector channel its resources that is required to fund the development plan in the best possible way while they get returns, we, uh, we, we also get the contribution to the growth that is so, uh, that is very important to need. And in all of this, there has to be a systematic system of monitoring of what are the outcomes that, of these targets that we have uh, set. We have um, supported our National Bureau of Statistics that for every category of data that they produce, they must make sure that the data is also disaggregated, especially for social reporting, like on poverty index, on jobs, that the data is disaggregated. So we see whether we are on the right track or we need to continuously remodel. In the financial services also, um, we have seen data that shows that women are further behind in terms of financial uh, inclusion. So there's a conscious effort also within the financial service using digital ID to bring as many women, unlike India, we have a lot of population that are still not uh, banked. They are not in the banking uh, system and the largest proportion of those are, are women. So when you bring women into the banking system, you're able to give them uh, financing uh, through the banking system more seamlessly. 
whether and if government has interventions to provide, you're able to do that because there are bank accounts and uh, identity numbers that you're able to channel those those uh, those support. So the the policy has to be deliberate, and it has to be consistent. Whether it is a private sector company, whether it is a public sector company, or um, even whether it is uh, the, the financial services and other services. We need to start also at the, at the ground level in engaging youths. Well, by the way, we don't have the, the problem we have. We have like 60% of our 206 million people are youths uh, and uh, very active youths, very vibrant. So in engaging youths, we have to be, begin to make that provision to say a certain percentage of the youth we employ, whether we're government or business, should be, should be girls. So that they are there from the beginning, they grow through the system, and then they have a chance to grow to the top. Well, you know, you ended on, on uh, an aspect which is controversial, an aspect that, that I think evokes a fair amount of discussion and debate on whether there should be reservation for women in different sectors. Should it be at the board level? Should it be at the entry level? Uh, and I think, you know, many companies and countries are grappling with this issue. But you talked about collaboration with the private sector, and I want to move that forward, uh, Minister Irani, to talk about global collaboration as well. This is a universal problem. It's a universal challenge. It is not Nigeria's problem or India's problem. You need to customize and de design solutions that are relevant for each country or each company, but this is a universal challenge. In the context of that, I want to address with you, uh, India takes on the G20 presidency. One of the issues that has been prioritized uh, for global collaboration by India as part of the G20 agenda is women-led development. So what can we expect on that front? I think, um, think Shireen, we have to recognize that the vocabulary of gender justice is undergoing a change without much reflection. On this panel today, we spoke about women from the context of the labor market. Not many of us prioritize women as entrepreneurial leaders, as though we as a gender are to feed just the labor market. So when we talk about the vocabulary of gender justice, we spoke today in this house about emancipation of women. And I'm very proud that the prime minister changed that narrative and we saw a tectonic shift where we now say women-led development, which means that for any nation to prosper, women have to be the helm of economic affairs. We have a female finance minister. That being said, um, I want to just elaborate on one or two challenges. We need to recognize that we will not have a one-size-fits-all solution. We have differentiated national potentials. We have differentiated national responsibilities and national challenges. Now, people say that technology is a great leveler and enabler for all genders. But what is the language of technology today available for women? Um, I will not speak from any other experience but the Indian experience. We are looking at an age of automation. The language of automation is English. India has 16,000 dialects, 125 languages which are constitutionally recognized. If you want to empower the agency of women technologically, do we have that technology in my native languages? That is one issue that needs to be addressed. It is not only a solution that we are seeking for gender justice, I think it has great financial potential for companies. The second issue is that when you talk about the presidency and India at the helm of that affair, we also look at the digital transformation. Gabriella spoke about the red flagging of health spend. Now let's take another Indian example, which is the Ayushman Bharat mm. program, which is the world's most I think, elaborate, ambitious health program. We put money behind ensuring that for 1,300 diseases, which includes cardiovascular issues and many other um, challenges that emanate from the health systems, 26,000 hospitals across the country are impaneled, servicing 100 million families, which means at least 100 million women where they can seek access free of cost for 1,300 diseases. Now, what is the impact? Societally and culturally, it was presumed that issues like breast cancer and cervical cancer are not largely spoken of given the cultural context of uh, closed societies. That is the presumption one had. Now, if you look at just one component of the success of the Ayushman Bharat program, the health program, we have in the past two years 
seen 130 million Indian women get themselves scanned for cervical cancer and breast cancer and receive treatment if they deemed it medically fit, free of cost. Governance and democracy has delivered on the health aspect, at least in India. So what is the agency that we bring to the G20 presidency? That when you talk about digital transformation, it need not be limited again to fiscal engagements, to building of corporations, to building of enterprise. It can have a cumulative effect across various segments, academics. We had a stagnant education policy for three decades. We brought about a new education policy. Did we do it only in the halls of power in New Delhi? No, we did not. The Prime Minister ensured that we have over 260,000 village education councils. All the councils were called upon. Universities and college systems and parent-teacher associations across all districts of India were asked, what is the kind of academic support you seek for your children? The Parents' Alliance, the Alliance of Young Students were all called upon. Then a policy was arrived upon. And one of the benefits of that collaboration between government and citizens is that for the first time, India now has a gender inclusion fund in our education policy to help build academic infrastructure, particularly aimed at young girls and women. So the other issue which uh, we hope through W20 to also leverage is the desire to ensure that we transition from innovation, especially in the gender space, to enterprise because a lot is um, left to be done in that segment. Today, 42% of STEM graduates in India are women. How do I encourage them that innovate for enterprise? And I think if that becomes a global call for action, much change can happen. Because do we reduce women only to consumption of technology? Or do we want to support them to become leaders of technological institutions or technological enterprise? So I think that the G20 gives us a unique opportunity to um, speak about our experiences, speak about our commitment, but also say to the G20 uh, coalition that we hope that this expression of experience somewhere percolates to the global south, to empower the global south. Because we, as a, a part of the presidency, are saying that this is not about the Indian future. This is about global future and gender justice for all women across all geographies. Absolutely, and I think that is the perfect opportunity for us to get uh, comments in from our participants here because it is going to require, as I pointed out, dialogue at different levels, dialogue within countries, within companies, and within the international alliance as well. So, uh, yes, ma'am, you have a question. I'm going to get a microphone across to you. Please go ahead. So thanks, thanks again for this opportunity. I'm Luana Geno from Brazil. I work with uh, inclusion in the labor market. I'll be brief. Um, in Brazil, in Latin America, uh, we are more than a 210 million uh, black and indigenous women and from marginalized groups. And I just would like to get to know from different reality standpoints, um, how do you ensure like intersectionality in policy making? and addressing marginalized groups' needs. I mean, I mean, especially from non-dominant groups, like from uh, low castes or, you know, um, low ethnicities or, you know, especially in Brazil, black and, and indigenous women, for example. Uh, it can be obviously from a uh, uh, disaggregated data standpoint, but also from a tech standpoint. But I just would like to know how do you do affirmative actions in different realities? Yeah, Thank you. Know, would you like to take that? Thank you, and a very good question, and, and something that I was beyond the intersectionality that you're talking about in terms of, of different ethnic backgrounds. We also need to speak about different gender identities, queer, non-binary, all the different um, um, identities that, that uh, people have. Uh, we haven't been, we've been speaking very much in a binary way, and that's part of our, our challenge going forward is great, as you say, and it, it's something for us to work on together on how policies can really address the, the intersecting uh, identities. And, and we, we know already we're starting from 178 countries that, don't, that have laws that restrict full participation of women, let alone all these um, uh, different gender identities that, that need to be central. So um, policies that are centered 
on, on what uh, the different groups would require specifically. So it would be, depending on context, and difficult to say a global response, but to say that it should be central to, to any policy work.